The Father's Message, Part 2. The second part begins on August 12th, 1932. I have just opened up a fountain of living water, which will never dry up from now until the end of time. I'm coming to you, my creatures, to open my paternal breast filled with love for you, my children. I want you to be witnesses of my infinite and merciful love. It's not enough for me to have shown you my love. I also want to open up my heart to you. Whence a refreshing spring will issue and where all men will quench their thirst. They'll then experience joys they've never known until now through being so weighed down by the exaggerated fear they had of me, their tender father. Since the time when I promised men a savior, I have let this spring gush forth. I have been able to see this spring every day since he first talked about it. I made it pass through my son's heart to reach you. But my immense love for you makes me do even more, opening my breast from which this water of salvation will gush for my children. And I permit them to draw freely whatever they need for time and for eternity. If you wish to test the power of this spring about which I'm talking, first learn to know me better and to love me to the extent that I desire. That is, not only as a father, but as your friend and confidant. Why are you so surprised by what I'm saying? Did I not create you in my image? I did this so that you should find nothing strange when you talk on familiar terms with your father, your creator, and your God. For you have become the children of my fatherly and divine love through my merciful goodness. My son Jesus is in me, and I am in him. In our interchanging love, which is the Holy Spirit, who keeps us united in this bond of love so as to make us one. My son is the vessel of this fountain that men may go and draw from his heart, which is always full to overflowing with the water of salvation. But you have to assure yourselves of the existence of this fountain which my son opens up for you, so that you can convince yourselves that it is fresh and pleasing. So, come to me through my son, and once you are close to me, confide your desires to me. I will show you this fountain, making myself known to you as I really am. When you know me, your thirst will be quenched, you will be revived, your ills will be cured, your fears will vanish. Your joy will be great, and your love will feel securer than it has ever been before. But you will say to me, how can we come to you? <laughs> come by the path of confidence. Call me your father. Love me in spirit and truth. And this will be enough to make this refreshing and powerful water quench your thirst. But if you really want this water to give you all you need to know and love me, and if you feel cold and indifferent, call me by the sweet name of Father, and I will come to you. My spring will give you love, confidence, and everything you need to be loved forever by your Father and Creator. As I desire most to be known by all of you, so that you can all enjoy, even here on earth, my goodness and my tenderness, make yourselves apostles to those who still do not know me, and I will bless your toil and efforts, preparing great glory for you with me in eternity. I am the ocean of charity, my children, and this is another proof of the paternal love I feel for all of you without exception regardless of your age, your status, or your country. Nor do I exclude different societies, sects, believers, unbelievers, the indifferent. I enfold in this love all the rational creatures who make up humanity. Here is the proof of this. 
I am the ocean of charity. I showed you the spring which pours from my breast to quench your thirst. And now, in order to let you see my goodness towards everyone, I'm going to show you the ocean of my universal charity, that you may dive into it blindly. Why? So that, diving into this ocean, souls rendered bitter by faults and sins may lose that bitterness in this bath of love. They will emerge from this ocean better, happy at having learned how to be good and charitable. If, because of ignorance or weakness, you yourselves happen to fall again into this state of bitterness, I shall still be an ocean of charity, ready to receive this bitter drop, transform it into charity and goodness, and make you holy as I, your father, am. My children, do you want to live your life on earth peacefully and joyfully? Come and cast yourselves into this immense ocean and remain in it forever. As you work and live your normal life, this life will be sanctified through charity. As for my children who do not follow the truth, I wish all the more to enfold them in my fatherly predilection so that they may open their eyes to the light which now shines more clearly than ever. This is the time of graces, foreseen and awaited since the beginning of time. I am here personally to talk to you. I come as the most tender and loving of fathers. I stoop down, forgetful of myself, to raise you up to me and ensure your salvation. All of you who are now living and you too who are in the void but who will live century after century until the end of the world. Remember, you're not alone. The Father thinks of you and offers you a share in the unfathomable privileges of his love. Approach the spring which will gush forever from my fatherly breast. Taste the sweetness of this health-giving water. And when you've felt all its delicious power in your souls, satisfying all your needs, come and cast yourselves into the ocean of my charity, so as to live only in me, to die to yourselves, and to live eternally in me. Our father told me, in an intimate dialogue, the spring is the symbol of my knowledge, the ocean is that of my charity and of your trust. When you wish to drink from this spring, study me in order to know me, and when you know me, dive into the ocean of my charity, trusting in me with a confidence so deep as to transform yourselves. This I shall be unable to resist. I shall then forgive your errors and lavish the greatest favours upon you. I am among you. Happy are those who believe this truth and who take advantage of this time about which the scriptures have spoken thus. There will come a time when God must be honoured and loved by men as he desires. The scriptures then go on to ask why and answer, because he alone is worthy of honor, love and praise forever. Moses received from me as the first of the Ten Commandments this command to be communicated to men, love and worship God. Those who are already Christians may say, we have loved you since we were born or since our conversion as we often say in the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, who art in heaven. Yes, my children, it is true, you do love me and honor me when you say the first part of the Our Father. But continue with the other requests, and you will see. Hallowed be thy name. Is my name being blessed? Continue. Thy kingdom come. 
Has my kingdom come? You honor very fervently the kingship of my son Jesus, it is true, and in him you are honoring me. But will you deny your father this great glory of proclaiming him king, or at least of letting me reign until all men can know and love me? I desire you to celebrate this feast of the kingship of my son in reparation for the insults he received before Pilate, and from the soldiers who scourged his holy and innocent humanity. I ask you not to suspend this feast, but on the contrary, to celebrate it enthusiastically and fervently. But in order that everyone may really know this king, they must know his kingdom as well. Now, to achieve this dual knowledge perfectly, it is also necessary to know the father of this king, the maker of this kingdom. Truly, my children, the church, this society I entrusted my son to found, will complete its work by honoring him who is its author, your father and creator. Some of you, my children, may reply, the church has grown continuously. Christians are more and more numerous. This is sufficient proof that our church is complete. No, my children, that your father has always kept watch over the church since its birth, and that along with my son and the Holy Spirit, I wanted it to be infallible through my vicar, the Holy Father. However, is it not true that if Christians knew me as I am, the tender and merciful, good and liberal Father, they would practice this holy religion more fervently and more sincerely. My children, is it not perhaps true that if you knew you had a Father who thinks of you and loves you infinitely, you would, in your turn, make an effort to be more faithful to your Christian duties, as well as to your duties as citizens, to be just and to render justice to God and to men. Is it not true that if you knew this Father who loves you all without distinction and who without distinction calls you all by the sweet name of children, you would love me as affectionate children and that this love under my impulse would become an active love extending itself to the rest of humanity who still do not know this Christian society, and who even less know him who created them and is their father. If somebody went and talked to these souls abandoned to their superstitions, or to so many others who call me God because they know I exist but not that I am close to them, if somebody said to them that their maker is their father as well, and that he thinks of them and is concerned with them, that he surrounds them with intimate affection in their sorrows and dejection, this would obtain the conversion of even the most stubborn ones, and these conversions would be more numerous and firm, that is, more persevering. Some of you examining this work of love I am carrying out among men will find cause for criticism and will say, but don't the missionaries, after arriving in those distant countries, talk to the non-believers about God, his goodness and his mercy? What more could they say about God, since they speak of him all the time? The missionaries have spoken and still speak of God as far as they know him. But I assure you, you do not know me as I am, because I am coming to proclaim myself the Father of all, and the most tender of fathers, in order to transform your love, which has become distorted by fear. I come to make myself similar to my creatures, to correct the idea you have of a terrifyingly just God, as I see men spending their whole lives without confiding in their only Father, whose only wish is to make their earthly life easier and to give them a divine life in heaven. This is a proof that souls do not know me any more than you do, not having overcome the idea 
you have about me. But now, I am giving you this light. Remain in the light and bring it to everybody, and it will be a powerful means both to obtain conversions and to shut, if possible, the gates of hell. For I now repeat my promise, which will last forever. All those who call me by the name of Father, even if only once, will not perish, but will be sure of their eternal life among the chosen ones. And to you, who will work for my glory and commit yourselves to making me known, honored, and loved, I give the assurance that your reward will be great, because I will count everything, even the smallest effort you make, and I will reward you a hundredfold in eternity. As I have told you, it is necessary to bring to fulfillment in the Holy Church the devotion which honors in a very special way this society's author, the one who came to found it, and the one who is its soul, God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Until the three persons are honored by a special devotion in the church and the whole of mankind, there will be something lacking in this society. I have already made some souls aware of this lack, but most of them, too timid, have not responded to my call. Others have had the courage to speak about it to the appropriate people, but in the face of their failure, they have not persisted. Now, my hour has come. I myself am coming to make men, my children, know what until today they have not understood completely. I myself am coming to bring the flame of the law of love, so that by this means, the enormous layer of ice that surrounds mankind can be melted and destroyed. O oh, beloved humanity, O oh, men who are my children, set yourselves free from the bonds in which the devil has chained you until now, inspiring in you fear of a father who is pure love. Come, come closer to me. You have every right to approach your father. Open up your hearts, pray to my son, that he may help you to know even better my goodness towards you. You who are prisoners of superstition and the laws of the devil, leave this tyrannical slavery and come to the truth of truths. Recognize the one who made you and is your father. Do not try to claim your rights, paying worship and homage to those who have led you to spend your life uselessly until now, but come to me. I am waiting for you all, because you are all my children. And you who are in the true light, tell them how sweet it is to live in the truth. Say also to those Christians, those dear creatures, my children, how sweet it is to think that there is a father who sees everything, knows everything, provides for everything, who is infinitely good, who forgives easily, and who punishes only reluctantly and slowly. Tell them to come to me. I will help them. I will lighten their burden and sweeten their hard life. I will inebriate them with my fatherly love to make them happy in time and in eternity. And you, my children, who have lost the faith and live in the darkness, raise your eyes. You will see shining rays coming to illuminate you. I am the sun that shines, warms, and rewarms. Look and recognize that I am your creator, your father, your one and only God. It is because I love you that I come to make you love me so that you may all be saved. I am speaking to all men the world over, making this appeal of my fatherly love ring out this infinite love that I want you to know is a permanent reality. Love, love, love always. 
but also show others how to love the Father, so that from today on I will be able to show you all the Father who loves you so passionately. And you, my beloved sons, priests and monks, I exhort you to make known this fatherly love that I have for men and for you in particular. You must work so that my will may be accomplished in all men and in you. It is that I should be known, honoured and loved. Do not leave my love inactive for a long time because I am thirsty in my desire to be loved. This century is privileged above all others. Do not let this privilege pass for fear that it might be withdrawn. Souls need a certain divine touch and time presses. Do not be afraid of anything. I am your father. I will help you in your efforts and your work. I will sustain you always and make you enjoy, already here below, peace and joy of soul, making your ministry and your zealous works bear fruit. This is an inestimable gift, since the soul, which is peaceful and joyful, already has a foretaste of heaven while awaiting its eternal reward. I communicated to my vicar, the Supreme Pontiff, my representative on earth, a very special predilection for the missionary apostolate in distant countries, and most of all, a great zeal to spread throughout the world the devotion to the sacred heart of my son Jesus. Now I am entrusting him with the work that this same Jesus came on earth to accomplish, to glorify me by making me known as I am, just as I am telling all men, my creatures and children. If men could penetrate the heart of Jesus in all its desires and its glory, they would realize that its most ardent desire is to glorify the Father, the one who sent him, and most of all, not to let his glory be diminished, as it has been until now. He desires the complete glory that men can and must give me as their Father and Maker, and still more, as the author of their redemption. I am asking of man what he is able to give me, his confidence, his love, and his gratitude. It is not because I need my creature and his adoration that I desire to be known, honoured, and loved. The only reason why I am stooping down to him is to save him and give him a share in my glory. Further, in my goodness and my love, I realize that the beings I have drawn from nothing and adopted as my true children are falling in great numbers into eternal unhappiness with the devils. They are thus failing to fulfill the purpose of their creation and are losing their time and their eternity. If there is something that I desire above all now, it is simply to see more fervor on the part of the just, a smooth path for the conversion of sinners, sincere and persevering conversion, and the return of the prodigal sons to their father's house. I am referring in particular to all who are my creatures and children, such as the schismatics, the heretics, the Freemasons, the poor infidels, the sacrilegious, and the various secret sects. I want this whole world to know that there is a God and a Creator. This God, who will address their ignorance twice over, is unknown to them. They do not know that I am their Father. Believe me, you who are listening to me as you read these words, if all men who are far from our Catholic Church heard people talking about this Father who loves them, who is their Creator and their God, about this Father who desires to give them eternal life, then many of these men, even the most obstinate ones, would come to this Father of whom you had spoken to them. If you cannot go to them and talk to them directly, look for other means, thousands of direct and indirect ways. 
put them into effect with the true spirit of disciples and with great fervor. I promise you that your efforts will soon be crowned with success by a special grace. Make yourselves apostles of my fatherly goodness, and because of the zeal I will give you all, you will be strong and powerful in your work among souls. I will always be close to you and in you. If there are two of you talking, I'll be with you. If there are more, I will be among you. Thus, you will say what I inspire you to say, and I will put your listeners in the right frame of mind to hear you. In this way, men will be conquered by love and saved for all eternity. With regard to the means of honoring me as I desire, all I ask of you is great confidence. Do not think I want austerities or mortifications. I do not want you to walk barefoot or to lay your faces in the dust or to cover yourselves with ashes. No, no. My dearest wish is that you behave as my children, simply and trusting in me. With you, I will become everything for everyone, the most tender and loving father. I will be on intimate terms with you, giving myself to you all, making myself small, so as to make you great for eternity. Most of the unbelievers, the impious and various communities, remain in their iniquity and unbelief because they think that I'm asking the impossible of them, that they have to submit to my commands like slaves of a tyrannical lord whose power and pride keep him distant from his subjects, to oblige them to show him respect and devotion. No, no, my children, I know how to make myself small, far smaller than you can imagine. However, what I do require is the faithful observance of the commandments I gave the church, so that you will be rational creatures and will not be like animals because of your lack of discipline and your evil inclinations, so that you will preserve the treasure which is the soul I gave you, clothed in the fullness of its divine beauty. Then, according to my desire, do what I have already instructed you to do, Honor me with a special devotion. May this make you know my will to give you many benefits and to let you share in large measure in my power and my glory, simply in order to make you happy and save you, and to show my sole desire to love you and be loved in return by you. If you love me as faithful children, you will also have loving and obedient respect for my church and my representatives. Not a respect such as you show now, which keeps you distant from me because you are afraid of me. This false respect that you have now is an injustice to justice. It is a wound you cause to the most sensitive part of my heart. You are forgetting, scorning, my fatherly love for you. What most grieved me about my people, Israel, and what most afflicts me still about present-day humanity, is this ill-conceived respect you have of me. Man's enemy has, in fact, used it to lead him to fall into idolatry and schisms. He is still using it, and will continue to use it against you to keep you distant from the truth, from my church and from me. Do not allow yourselves to be led any longer by the enemy. Believe in the truth that is being revealed to you and walk in the light of this truth. You, my children who are outside the Catholic Church, should realize that you are not excluded from my fatherly love. I am making this tender appeal to you because you too are my children. If you have lived up to now in the devil's snares, acknowledge that he has cheated you. Come to me, your father, and I will receive you with joy and love. And you, who only know the religion in which you have grown up, and that religion is not the true one, open your eyes. Here is your father, 
he who created you and he who wants to save you. I come to you to bring you the truth and salvation. I can see that you do not know me and do not realize that all I want is for you to know me as your Father, Creator and Savior. It is because of this ignorance that you cannot love me. Understand, therefore, that I am not as far from you as you think. How could I leave you alone after having created you and adopted you through my love? I follow you everywhere. I protect you always, so that everything may become a confirmation of my great liberality towards you, in spite of your forgetfulness about my infinite goodness. This forgetfulness makes you say, nature provides us with everything. It makes us live and die. This is the time of grace and light. Recognize then that I am the only true God. In order to give you real happiness in this life and in the next, I want you to do what I am suggesting to you in this light. The time is propitious. Do not lose this love which is being offered to your hearts so tangibly. I ask everyone to take part in the Holy Mass according to the liturgy. This pleases me greatly. Later on, I will suggest some short prayers to you, but I do not want to overburden you. The most important thing will be to honor me as I told you by establishing a feast in my honor and serving me with the simplicity of true children of your God, Father, Creator, and Savior of the human race. Here is another proof of my fatherly love for men. My children, I will not speak to you about the whole greatness of my infinite love, because you have only to open the holy books to look at the crucifix, the tabernacle, and the blessed sacrament to realize the extent to which I have loved you. Nevertheless, in order to show you that you need to satisfy my will for you and to make me better known and loved, I wish before ending these words, which only set out the basis of my work of love among men, to point out to you some of the innumerable proofs of my love for you. As long as man does not live in the truth, he cannot taste real freedom. You, my children, think you have joy and peace, you who are outside the true law for obedience to which I created you. But deep in your hearts, you feel that you have neither true peace nor true joy, and that you do not enjoy the true freedom of the one who created you and is your God and Father. But you, who abide in the true law, or rather, who have promised to follow the law that I gave you to ensure your salvation, have let vice lead you into evil. You have strayed from the law by behaving badly. Do you think you're happy? No. You feel that your hearts are not at ease. Do you suppose that looking for pleasure and other human joys, your hearts will finally be satisfied? No. Let me tell you, you will never feel truly free nor truly happy until you recognize me as your father and submit to my yoke to be true children of God, your father. Why? Because I created you for a single purpose, to know me, love me, and serve me. As a simple and trusting child serves its father. Once, in the Old Testament, men behaved like animals. They did not preserve any sign of their dignity as children of God, their Father. So, to make them realize that I wanted to raise them to the dignity of God's children, I sometimes had to show myself as terrifyingly severe. Later, when I saw that some of them were endowed with sufficient reason to understand, eventually, that it was necessary to distance themselves from the animals, I then began to lavish benefits on them, to give them victory over those who were still unable to recognize and preserve their own dignity. 
And as they were increasing in number, I sent my son to them. He was adorned with all the divine perfections because he was the son of a perfect God. It was he who showed them the ways to perfection. Through him, I adopted you in my infinite love as real children. Since then, I have never called you simply creatures, but children. I clothed you in the true spirit of the new law, which not only distinguishes you from animals, like the men of the old law, but raises you above those men of the Old Testament. I raised you all to the dignity of children of God. Yes, you are my children and you must tell me that I am your father. But trust in me, as children do, because without this trust, you will never be truly free. Everything I am saying to you is intended to make you realize that I come to carry out this work of love, to give you powerful help to cast off the tyrannical slavery which imprisons your souls and to let you enjoy real freedom, whence real happiness comes. Compared with this freedom, all earthly joys are as nothing. Raise yourselves to the dignity of children of God and learn how to respect your own greatness. I will then be your father more than ever, the most lovable and merciful of fathers. I have come to bring peace with this work of love, I will let a ray of peace fall upon anyone who honors me and trusts in me, so that he will be relieved of all his troubles, all his worries, sufferings, and afflictions, especially if he calls me and loves me as his father. If families honor me and love me as their father, I will give them my peace together with my providence. If workers businessmen and artisans invoke and honor me, I will give them my peace and my strength. I will show myself to be the good and merciful Father. If each Christian community invokes and honors me, I will give it my peace. I will show myself to be a most loving Father, and through my power I will ensure the eternal salvation of souls. If all mankind invokes and honors me, I will bring down upon it the spirit of peace like a benevolent dew. If all nations as such invoke and honor me, there will be no more discord nor wars because I am the God of peace. And where I am, there no war can be. Do you wish to gain victory over your enemy? Call upon me and you will triumph over him. Finally, you know that I can do everything because of my power. Well, I am offering this power to all of you, to use now and for eternity. I will always show myself to be your father, provided that you show yourselves to be my children. What do I desire to achieve with this work of love? if not to find hearts able to understand me. I am the holiness of which I possess the perfect and full expression. I offer you this holiness, of which I am the author through my Holy Spirit, and I instill it in your souls through my Son's merits. It is through my Son and the Holy Spirit that I am coming to you and into you, and it is in you that I seek my repose. To some souls, the words, I am coming into you, will seem a mystery, but it is not a mystery, because having instructed my son to institute the Holy Eucharist, I intended to come to you every time you receive the sacred host. Of course, nothing prevented me from coming to you even before the Eucharist, as nothing is impossible to me. But receiving this sacrament is an action that is easy to understand and 
It shows how I come to you. When I am in you, I can more easily give you what I possess, provided that you ask me for it. Through this sacrament, you are intimately united with me. It is in this intimacy that the outpouring of my love makes my holiness spread into your souls. I fill you with my love. Then, you have only to ask me for the virtues and perfection you need, and you can be sure that in those moments when God is reposing in his creatures, nothing will be refused you. Since you know my favorite place of rest, are you not going to offer it to me? I am your father and your God. Will you dare refuse me this? Do not let me suffer because of your cruelty towards a father who is asking you for this one favor for himself. Before ending this message, I want to express a wish to numerous souls who are consecrated to my service. You, priests and religious, are those souls. You are dedicated to my service, whether in the contemplative life or in charitable and apostolic works. For my part, this is a privilege granted through my goodness. For your part, it is faithfulness to your vocation, together with your good will. This is my desire. You, who find it easier to understand what I expect of mankind, pray to me so that I will be able to accomplish my work of love in all souls. You know all the difficulties that have to be overcome to win a soul. Well, this is the effective means of helping you to bring a great number of them to me. This means is that of making me known, loved, and honored by men. I want you to be the first ones to start doing this. What joy for me to enter first the houses of priests and religious. What joy to find myself as father amid the children of my love. With you, I will converse as with intimate friends. I will be for you the most discreet of confidence. I will be everything to you. I will satisfy all your needs. Most of all, I will be the father who receives your requests, who lavishes his love, his benefits, and his universal tenderness upon you. Do not refuse me this joy, which I desire to enjoy with you. I will give it back to you a hundredfold. And since you will honor me, I will honor you too, by preparing great glory for you in my kingdom. I am the light of lights. Where it penetrates, there will be life, bread, and happiness. This light will illuminate the pilgrim, the skeptic, the ignorant. It will illuminate you all, O oh men, who live in this world of darkness and vice. If you did not have my light, you would fall into the abyss of eternal death. Finally, this light will lighten the ways which lead to the true Catholic Church for its poor children who are still victims of superstition. I will show myself as a father to those who suffer most on earth, the poor lepers. I will show myself to be the father of all those who are abandoned, the outcasts of every human society. I will show myself as a father to the afflicted, the sick, and above all, to those who are in agony. I will show myself as a father to all families, to orphans, widows, prisoners, workers, and the young. I will show myself as the father of kings, the father of their nations. You will all feel my goodness and my protection. You will all see my power. My fatherly and divine blessing on everyone. Amen. Amen. Especially to my son and representative. Amen. Amen.
especially to my son, the bishop. Amen. Amen. Especially to my son, your spiritual father. Amen. Amen. Especially to my daughters, your mothers. Amen. Amen. To all the congregation of my love. Amen. Amen. To all the church and to all the clergy. Amen. Amen. To the church in purgatory, a very special blessing. Amen. 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 Testimony of the Right Reverend Alexandre Caillot, Bishop of Grenoble, following the report prepared during the canonical inquiry into the case of Mother Eugenia. Ten years have passed since, as Bishop of Grenoble, I decided to open an inquiry into Mother Eugenia's case. I now have enough information to bring my testimony as Bishop before the Church. The first thing to emerge with certainty from the inquiry is that Mother Eugenia's considerable virtues are well established. From the beginning of her religious life, the sister had attracted her superior's attention because of her piety, her obedience and her humility. Her superiors, perplexed by the extraordinary nature of the events which occurred during her novitiate, had not wanted to let her stay on in the convent. After some hesitation, they had to abandon their plan when faced with the nun's exemplary conduct. During the inquiry, Sister Eugenia showed great patience and the utmost docility in submitting without complaint to all the medical tests, answering the theological and medical commissions, often long and distressing questioning, and accepting contradictions and trials. Her simplicity in particular was praised by all the investigators. A number of circumstances also showed the nun to be capable of practicing virtue 
to a heroic degree. According to the theologians, an especially striking feature was her obedience during Father Auguste Valenciennes' inquiry in June 1934 and her humility on the sad day of 20th of December 1934. I can attest that while she was Superior General, I found her very devoted to her duty, dedicating herself to her task, which must have seemed all the more difficult to her as she was not prepared for it, with great love for souls, her congregation and the church. Those close to her are struck, as I myself am, by her strength of spirit in facing difficulties. I am impressed not only by her virtues, but also by the qualities she displays in exercising her authority. Also striking is the fact that a relatively uneducated nun should come to fill her congregation's highest office. In this there is already something extraordinary, and from this point of view, the inquiry conducted by my Vicar General, Monsignor Guerry, on the day of her election is very significant. The answers given by the chapter members and by the superiors and delegates of the various missions showed that they were choosing Mother Eugenia as their superior general in spite of her youth and the canonical obstacles which would normally have caused the idea of her nomination to be rejected because of her qualities of judgment, balanced temperament, energy and firmness. Reality would seem to have far surpassed the hopes that her electors placed in her. What I especially noticed in her was her lucid, lively and penetrating intelligence. I said that her education had been inadequate, but this was for external reasons, over which she had no control. Her mother's long illness had compelled her at a very early age to look after the house and be absent from school very often. Then, before she entered the convent, there were the hard years she worked in industry as a weaver. Notwithstanding these basic gaps, the consequences of which are evidenced in her style and spelling, Mother Eugenia gives many lectures in her community. It is worth noting that she herself compiles her congregation circulars and the contracts with municipal authorities or administrative councils regarding the hospital institutes of Our Lady of the Apostles. She has also compiled a long directory. She sees every situation clearly and correctly, as if it were a matter of conscience. Her instructions are straightforward, precise and very practical. She knows each of her 1400 daughters personally, and also their attitudes and their virtues. Hence she is able to select those who are most qualified to perform various tasks. She also has an accurate personal knowledge of her congregation's needs and resources. She knows the situation in every house and has visited all her missions. We wish to emphasize also her spirit of far-sightedness. She has taken all the necessary measures for every hospital or school to have qualified nuns and whatever they need to live and develop. I find it particularly interesting to note that Mother Eugenia seems to possess a spirit of decisiveness, a sense of reality and a creative will. In six years, she has founded 67 institutes and has been able to introduce very useful improvements in her congregation. If I single out her qualities of intelligence, judgment and will, and her powers of administration, it is because they seem to me to rule out definitively all the hypotheses about hallucinations, illusions, spiritism, hysteria or delirium. These were examined during the inquiry, but proved incapable of giving a satisfactory explanation of the facts. Mother Eugenia's life is a constant demonstration of her mental and general equilibrium, which to the observer seems to be the dominant feature of her personality. Other hypotheses about suggestibility and manageability led the investigators to wonder whether they might be dealing with a very impressionable temperament, like a multifaceted mirror which reflects all influences and suggestions. These hypotheses were also rejected for reasons of everyday reality. 
Although Mother Eugenia is gifted with a sensitive nature and an emotional disposition, she has shown that she has never favoured anyone, and far from letting herself be influenced by human considerations, she has always been able to determine her own projects and activities and to gain the acceptance of others through her personal insight. A simple account is worth more than any other consideration. The day after her election as Superior General, she had to nominate her superiors. Well, she didn't hesitate to substitute one of them who had just voted for her and who, landing in Egypt, found out about the annulment of the appointment, which she was given notice of by airmail. The object of the mission. The object of the mission, which would appear to have been entrusted to Mother Eugenia, is precise, and from the doctrinal point of view, I see it as legitimate and timely. Its precise object is to make God the Father known and honoured, mainly by the institution of a special feast which has been requested of the Church. The inquiry established that a liturgical feast in honour of the Father would be quite in keeping with Catholic practice as a whole. It would accord with the traditional thrust of Catholic prayer, which ascends to the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit, as shown by the prayers of the Mass and the liturgical oblation to the Father during the Holy Sacrifice. However, it is strange that there is no special feast in honour of the Father. The Trinity is honoured as such. The Word and the Holy Spirit are honoured by their mission and external manifestations. Only the Father has no feast of his own, which would draw the attention of the Christian people to his person. This is the reason why a fairly extensive survey of the faithful has shown that in the various social classes, and even among many priests and religious, the Father is unknown. No one prays to him. No one thinks of him. The survey reveals rather surprisingly that a large number of Christians remain distant from the Father because they see him as a terrifying judge. They prefer to turn to Christ's humanity. And how many ask Jesus to protect them from the Father's anger? A special feast would thus have the effect, firstly, of re-establishing order in the spirituality of many Christians, and secondly, of leading them back to the divine Saviour's instruction, everything you ask the Father in my name, and again, you will pray like this, our Father, a liturgical feast dedicated to God the Father would also have the effect of raising our eyes towards the one whom the Apostle St. James called the Father of Light from whom every gift comes. It would accustom souls to consider God's goodness and his fatherly providence. They would realise that this providence is truly that of God the Holy Trinity and that it is because of his divine nature, common to all three persons, that God spreads through the world the ineffable treasures of his infinite mercy. It would seem at first sight as if there were no special reason to honour the Father in particular. But was it not the Father who sent his Son into the world? If it is supremely right to show devotion to the Son and the Holy Spirit because of their external manifestations, would it not be right and proper to give thanks to God the Father as the prefaces of the Mass require, for the gift he sent us, his Son. The real object of this special feast thus becomes plain, to honour the Father, to thank him, to praise him for having given us his Son. In a word, as the message states, as the author of our redemption, to thank him who loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son, so that all men might be brought together in the mystical body of Christ and together with this Son become his children. At a time when the world is troubled by secular doctrines, atheism and modern philosophies and no longer recognises God, the true God, would not this feast make known to many the living Father, the Father of mercy and goodness whom Jesus has revealed to us? 
would it not contribute to an increase in the number of those who worship the Father, in spirit and in truth, to whom Jesus referred? Now, when the world is being torn apart by deadly wars, when it feels the need to seek a solid principle of union to bring the peoples closer together, this feast would bring a great light. It would teach men that they all have the same Father in heaven, the one who gave them Jesus, towards whom he draws them as members of his mystical body in the unity of the same spirit of love. When so many souls are weary and tired of the tribulations of war, they may well be hungering for a deep spiritual life. Might not such a feast call them, then, from within, to worship the Father who hides himself and to offer themselves in a filial and generous oblation to the Father, the only source of the life of the Holy Trinity in them? Would it not preserve that fine movement of supernatural life which naturally draws souls towards spiritual childhood and, through confidence, towards filial life with the Father, towards abandonment to the divine will, towards the spirit of faith. On the other hand, a problem of doctrine arises, quite apart from the question of a special feast, and regardless of what the Church may decide on this matter. Some eminent theologians believe that the doctrine of the soul's relationship with the Trinity needs to be examined more deeply, and that it could be for souls a source of enlightenment on the life of union with the Father and the Son, about which St. John speaks, and on the sharing in the life of Jesus, Son of the Father, especially in his filial love for the Father. But apart from these theological reasons, what I wish to underline here is this. A poor young woman, unversed in theology, declares that she is receiving messages from God and these may be very rich in doctrine. The works of an imaginary visionary are poor, barren and inconsistent. However, the message that Mother Eugenia says the Father entrusted to her is fertile. There is a harmonious interaction of two different characters which tends to confirm its authenticity. On the one hand, it is presented as something traditionally held by the Church, without any suspicious innovations, for it incessantly repeats that everything has already been said in Christ's revelation about his Father, and that everything is in the Gospel. But, on the other hand, it declares that this great truth concerning knowledge of the Father needs to be reconsidered, studied deeply, and experienced. Does not the disproportion between the weakness of the instrument, incapable of discovering a doctrine of this nature by itself, and the depth of the message being conveyed, reveal that a superior, supernatural, divine cause has intervened to entrust the sister with this message? I cannot see how, humanly speaking, one could explain the nun's discovery of an idea the originality and fecundity of which the theologians conducting the inquiry were able to perceive only gradually. Another fact seems to me equally significant. When Sister Eugenia made it known that she had been receiving apparitions of the Father, the investigating theologians replied that apparitions of the Father were in themselves impossible and that they had never occurred before in history. The sister held out against these objections, declaring simply, The father told me to describe what I saw. He asks his sons, the theologians, to search. The nun never changed her testimony in any way. She maintained her statements over many months. It was not until January 1934 that the theologians discovered in St. Thomas Aquinas himself the answer to their objection. The answer given by the great doctor of the church about the distinction between apparition and mission was enlightening. It removed the obstacle which was paralyzing the whole inquiry. Challenged by wise theologians, the uneducated little nun proved to be right. How, humanly speaking, 
Could we explain, in this case too, the nun's insight, wisdom and perseverance? A false visionary would have tried to adapt herself to the theologian's explanations. The nun, however, held her ground. These are the additional reasons why her testimony seems trustworthy to us. In any case, what I find worthy of note is her reserved attitude towards the miraculous aspects of the case. While false visionaries give pride of place to extraordinary phenomena and even see nothing but these, Mother Eugenia, on the contrary, puts them second as proofs, as means. There is no state of exaltation, but there is a balance of values which makes a favourable impression. I will refer only briefly to the theologian's inquiry. The Reverend Fathers Albert and Auguste Valensin are highly esteemed for their philosophical and theological authority and for their deep knowledge of the spiritual life. Their intervention was required in other similar inquiries. We know that they acted with great circumspection, and that is why we selected them for this work. We are grateful for their devoted and conscientious collaboration. Their testimony in favour of the sister, and of a supernatural explanation of the facts as a whole, is all the more remarkable as they delayed their judgment for a long time, being at first hostile and sceptical, and then hesitant. Little by little, they became convinced, after raising all kinds of objections and imposing hard tests on the nun. Conclusions of the Right Reverend Alexandre Caillot, Bishop of Grenoble. Following the report prepared during the canonical inquiry into the case of Mother Eugenia. Following the dictates of my soul and my conscience, and with the keenest sense of my responsibility to the Church, I declare that supernatural and divine intervention seems to me the only logical and satisfactory explanation of the facts. Isolated from all the surrounding features of the case, this essential fact seems to me to be noble, lofty and supernaturally rich, that a humble nun has called souls to true devotion to the Father, such as Jesus taught and the Church has enshrined in its liturgy. There is nothing alarming in this, only something that is very simple and in accordance with solid doctrine. The miraculous facts which accompany this message could be separated from the main event, and its value would still be preserved in its entirety. For doctrinal reasons, the Church will declare whether the idea of a special feast can be considered separately from this particular case involving the sister. I believe that the fundamental proof of the authenticity of the nun's mission is shown by the way in which she puts into practice in her life the beautiful doctrine which she was apparently destined to remind us of. I deem it proper to let her continue her work. I believe that the hand of God is in all this. After ten years of research, reflection and prayer, I bless the Father for having deigned to choose my diocese as the place for such touching manifestations of his love. Mother Eugenia's Prayer to the Father God is my Father, through him, with him, and in him. God is my Father. God is my Father, my Father in heaven. How sweet it is to know that you are my Father and that I am your child, especially when the skies of my soul are cloudy and my cross weighs more heavily. I feel the need to repeat to you, Father, I believe in your love for me. Yes, I believe that you are a Father to me at every moment of my life and that I am your child. I believe that you love me with an infinite love. 
I believe that you're watching over me night and day and that not a hair falls from my head without your permission. I believe that in your infinite wisdom you know better than I what is good for me. I believe that in your infinite power you can bring good even out of evil. I believe that in your infinite goodness you make everything to the advantage of those who love you. Even under the hands of those who strike me, I kiss your hand which heals. I believe, but increase in me faith, hope and love. Teach me always to see your love as my guide in every event of my life. Teach me to surrender myself to you like a baby in its mother's arms. Father, you know everything, you see everything. You know me better than I know myself. You can do everything and you love me. My father, since it is your wish that we should always turn to you, I come with confidence to ask you, together with Jesus and Mary. Here request the favour that you desire. For this intention, and uniting myself to their most sacred hearts, I offer you all my prayers, my sacrifices and mortifications, all my actions and greater faithfulness to my duties. Give me the light the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. Strengthen me in this spirit that I may never lose him, never sadden him and never allow him to become weaker in me. My Father, I ask this in the name of Jesus, your Son, and you, Jesus. Open your heart and place it in my own and together with Mary's offer it to our Divine Father. Obtain for me the grace that I need. Divine Father, call all men to yourself. Let all the world proclaim your fatherly goodness and your divine mercy. Be a tender father to me and protect me wherever I am, like the apple of your eye. Make me always a worthy daughter. Have mercy on me. Divine Father, sweet hope of our souls, may you be known honored and loved by all men. Divine Father, infinite goodness put out on all peoples, may you be known, honored and loved by all men. Divine Father, beneficent you of humanity, may you be known, honored and loved by all men. Divine, Divine Father, Father, sweet hope of our souls, souls. May, you may you be known, honored and loved by all men. Divine Father, infinite goodness put out on all people. May you be known, honored and loved by all men. Divine Father, beneficent you of humanity. May you be known, honored and loved by all men. Those of you who in your hearts feel the desire to respond to the Father's love, recite with us this act of consecration. Father, I abandon myself into your hands. Do with me what you will. Whatever you may do, I thank you. I am ready for all. I accept all. Let only your will be done in me and in all your creatures. I wish no more than this, O Lord. Into your hands I commend my soul. I offer it to you with all the love of my heart, for I love you, Lord, and so need to give myself, to surrender myself into your hands without reserve and with boundless confidence. For you are my Father. <laughs> 